What's up, everybody? I'm continuing the journey, continuing the conversation. And this is a big one. I get this question all the time. I mean, I think at least, hmm, I don't, I, all the time. And, you know, obviously, Africa is my lane. So a lot of people say, well, what's your favorite African country? The automatic assumption, because I'm in Ghana, my base is in Ghana, I talk about Ghana, I love Ghana, um, I have immersed myself in Ghanaian culture and the people and, and all of that and been all over Ghana, but they uh, assume that Ghana is my favorite country. And I have to say, still to this day, I do not have, have a favorite African country, I should say. Um, and let me explain to you why I don't have a favorite as of yet. I might, it may come over time. Uh, the first reason why is because I'm still exploring. And then the other part is that everywhere I go, I find something that I love about the country. The next thing is, and, and another reason why I, I don't get into the country comparison so much when I say this meaning, and you're going to hear me say different things about different countries, um, but I don't get into country comparisons because the countries are like made up, meaning the, the borders were carved out in 1885, the governments were created in the late 1950s, 60s, all the way up into the 90s. So... And these governments were are, are basically uh, mirroring Western systems and all of that. So I look at that and I say, okay, I can't get into arguing and debating people over which country is better because this one is doing this over that one. And then you just kind of, when you start following the money, you kind of realize the money all goes back to the same source or sources on some level. So what I decided to do that, uh, is to embrace the... Go, go a little bit closer, like on the micro level and embrace the cultural aspects of it. But then re then being honest with myself at the same time. And that's kind of what, what I want to uh, look at as far as being honest with myself. So you'll hear me mention country names and I'll talk about some of the things that I really enjoy about those countries. Uh, but this is what makes it so difficult you know, for me. Now, other people have expressed they have favorite countries, they love certain aspects of it, they've been to this country, that country, and they have settled on the places that there's favorite. And that's, I think that's good. I mean, as, as far as for what they're trying to do, I think that's a, I have no problem with that at all. But I think that when, 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 when people say, you know, you got to have a favorite country, um, that that's when I get a little, you know, I'm just not there yet. I'm still exploring. I mean, I was just in Senegal and the Gambia. And if I just went off of what the perception I had in my mind about Senegal and the Gambia and listening to other people and what they said, then I, I, I would have visited, but it wouldn't have been high on the list. But guess what? I had the best time. Go look at the video. Go look at my video with Senegal and the Gambia, me walking through the streets of the Gambia, me walking with the lions in Senegal, uh, on the ATV, all that kind of stuff. That, I mean... I would have never known had it not gone, you know, so, so there is something I, I love the accommodations in both places. I mean, first class accommodations, slept like a baby, enjoyed the food. So that's what I'm saying. I was like, well, wow, I, uh, would I go back in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat, would I go back to Senegal and the Gambia? Absolutely. All right. So, um, uh, here, here are a couple of things for me, though, and, and, I, and I'm only speaking for me, only speaking for me. I, um, when, when I came to Africa for the first time, I went to Ghana, um, I didn't, uh, I intentionally wanted to go to Ghana, and somebody had, had some old slick stuff to say when I said this, when I did my interview with Brittany. Uh, you know, I said I wanted to go to some place as far as in the middle from what I was familiar with and then what I was not familiar with. Then maybe that's a better way to say it so they can understand it. I'm familiar with American amenities, culture, systems, all of that. So I didn't want to go for my first trip to Africa. I did not want to go to a place that mirrored America. So I wanted, but I also didn't want to go someplace that I was completely unfamiliar with 
and Ghana just happened to fall right in the middle of those two. And so that's what, um, you know, I, I made the right decision. And then my second country was, um, was actually uh, Tanzan Tanzania, Tanzania. And from there, I went to climb Kilimanjaro and all that good stuff. But every place left an indelible impression on me to the point where I've been back to Tanzania what, two, three times now. Obviously, Ghana, I've been to South Africa twice, been to Nigeria twice. People told me, don't go to Nigeria, don't go to, it's bad in Nigeria, Nigeria, even in the comments of the night, somebody, Nigeria's a slum. I'm like, clearly they have not been to Nigeria, clearly. They have not been to Nigeria if they're saying the whole country is a slum. Um, they clearly have not been. Some of the sharpest people, what, what I admired about Nigeria was just the vibe of the people. The vibe of the people was very similar to what I experienced in America, meaning they're different cultures, but just their, their energy, their vibe was just very familiar. And that's something I enjoyed. Um, I stayed at the Radisson Blue. I stayed at the Hilton. I stayed, so when people saying that they, 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 you're gonna be sleeping out on the streets and stuff's gonna be all out of, mm, I just didn't have that experience in Nigeria. And look, I'm trying to get back to Nigeria, actually. <laughs> so I wanna spend some more time in Nigeria. I really would like to spend like a month in Nigeria and just kind of go different places. And, and and yeah, you do need to be mindful in Nigeria. Now, I walked down the street in Lagos. I didn't do it at night, uh, but I walked down the street in Lagos and I was probably in an area that was, was relatively safe. You know, it's like any place else. I tell black people in America, I say, if you can live in America in one of these cities, Baltimore, Chicago, D.C., um, Detroit, or whatever, if you can do that, then you can navigate. Your street sense is going to kick in. And you're going to say, you know what? I might not need to go over there at this particular time. I might need to just lay low. Let me just figure out where the spots are, and then I'll stay in those particular areas. So... Um, but, but a lot of times what I hear people do is they'll just compare. This is nice. This is nice. This is nice. This is, this is nice. This is nice. Based upon Western standards. But those same people will complain about the West. <sighs> so I had to check myself. I was like, now, like right now, y'all, y'all can see. <laughs> I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa right now. I'm in a five-star accommodation. I will be in another five-star accommodation, and it is lovely. I'm having a great time. It is, you know, I'm obviously I'm solo, but it's like this is, I mean, the room is, I mean, spectacular. Uh, the hotel is spectacular. I had great food, just a great vibe, all of that. I love that. So it's, it, it, it is what it is. That's a part of what I love about Joe Berg, Durban, and Cape Town. Those amenities are I'm very familiar. It's, you know, I'm not thinking about the water that I'm drinking. It's just a really easy kind of time. That's why I like, I, I'm, I'm definitely going to buy a spot. I don't know where I'm going to get in, in, in South, uh, South Africa. I, I haven't, I really like Cape Town um, because it reminds me of where I grew up in DC uh, on the water, Southwest waterfront. But, um, but I really like Durban uh, and I really like Joburg. But, South Africa is not my favorite African country. It's like there are parts of it that like, if, as far as amenities and all of that, South Africa, as far as hotels and, 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 and the whole nine, I mean, like the dining experience that I had, so far South Africa has that. That's what I enjoy. But Nigeria has my vibe. So you see what I'm saying? See, see, Nigeria has my vibe, they got the hotels too. They got that whole thing. Nigeria is more of an organic vibe that flows with, like, connects with my soul. You know, that's just a, that's a connects with my soul type of vibe. Uh, and South, uh, South Africa has some of that going on, too, as a matter of fact, when I think about it. But Nigeria has that thing that just kind of kind of clicks in that particular way. It just does. Um, Ghana has that same kind of thing, too, where it just kind of connects with the soul. And um, so we're going to hop over to um, the East, when I think about Ethiopia, what Ethiopia has about it is it really has preserved a lot of its ancient culture and history. So when I'm there, I don't feel as though the people have been as tainted as other parts. And when I say tainted, meaning tainted with 
um, European uh, ideologies and all that. Although they speak English and Amharic, uh, and although you can see the influence that the West has crept in, don't get me wrong, it has crept in, especially when I saw them white Jesuses in Lali Bella. I said, the West has crept in, but there's something that really feels indigenous about Ethiopia. Uh, and that's something I, I want to spend more time in Ethiopia too, just to kind of get a vibe. I'm not Ethiopian or anything, not trying to say I'm Ethiopian. Um, and some people do, you know, they just try to make themselves whatever. But it was just, just the vibe there. Uh, the vibe was, I mean, it's, it's just a lot to learn. And I think that's the thing that when I go to different countries, I'm always learning something new, always seeing something new. Let me think, uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Um, Tanzania by itself. I've not been to Dar es Salaam, so my next trip I'm going to go to Dar es Salaam. We're working on a documentary, so I'm going to go to Dar and see what's happening in Dar. I spent a lot of time in Zanzibar. I feel very familiar, very comfortable, and very familiar in Zanzibar. For some for some reason, I just do uh, in 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 that in that space. Maybe because I've just been there a few times, but I really enjoy like Arusha in Tanzania. And that whole Kilimanjaro area, Serengeti, I, I love the Serengeti. That's about my, I love the Serengeti. I love the Gorongoro Crater. I love it. So that's just another piece of the puzzle. Uh, a lot of times people will go to one African country and they'll formulate their opinion about the whole continent based on one African country. I went to whatever whatever country, Burundi, and ah, that's Africa. But it's so diverse, so different, so many different things. It's really uh, fascinating. The other thing is, um, when, when, for me, when it comes to Which one do I? But for me, what I, I the other thing that I enjoy about traveling to different parts of Africa is that I'm able to I'm able to grow because of my ability to adapt to different cultures. There are a lot of times I hear people say, "Well, how have these countries adapted to us?" They, you know, the West. You know, how, how have they adapted to us? How have they adapted to the diaspora? How have they done all these things for us? For me, I'm like, well, for me, how I grow is how I adapt to them. Why should they adapt to me? Now, granted, if you invite somebody to come, then you, there should be some adapting that's, that's taking place. But at the same time, I also recognize that as I'm able to adapt, I'm changing and growing as a person. Things that I thought that I would never do or that would have taken me outside of my comfort zone, I'm willing to do now. And what that does for me is it gives me a greater level of global confidence. When I see the Chinese go and open a business anywhere in the world with no fear, then it gives me the confidence to be like, you know what, I need to go in and just just like they go into the villages and do it. I, I should be able to do that too. I'll never forget the time there was a lady who was trying to get me to go on a trip to Israel. And she was telling me, she said, well, Jay, she said, you know, I lived in Ghana for, I forget how long, she said six months or something like that. She said, I can speak tree. And, and she's a white evangelical. You hear, hear what I'm saying? White evangelical talking about she can speak tree. She said she would go back to her African American friends and say, "Well, why don't y'all go, you know, go to Ghana and visit Ghana?" Oh no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And she's like, "I'm more African than you." And then they would get offended. And then you think about it, though, she knew the language. She got among the people. And really that title African American was just a title somebody put on them because they didn't have any cultural connection. And I recognized that when I came to Africa, I had no legitimate cultural connection to the continent. I just had a title that was given to me and I didn't have that cultural connection other than food. You know, we saw with the documentary 
uh, high on the hog and all that. We see that this stuff is in us on, on different levels, but I just didn't want to be that person that came to Africa and faked myself out by saying I've just been to Africa, but I really didn't get connected to the people and to the culture. So I had to learn how to adapt. The other thing I had to learn how to do for me, for me is get rid of the entitlement mentality. And that's something I see a lot of times where, again, we feel as though we're entitled for somebody to do something for us. I've heard people say that Africa should give African Americans something because the African countries sold the you know our ancestors into slavery. And I just had to remind them that none of those African countries existed during slavery. So that that's the first thing that's off. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, if you want to go that deep with it, you want to find out who was running Africa during that time and perhaps go to them to get the things that you feel as though the African countries that didn't exist. Oh, you know, so, so again, I had to start learning and filtering out this entitlement mentality. I had to get this, and this is why a lot of a lot of African Americans come to Africa and they're disappointed because they're coming with the same. They're coming with an entitlement mentality, like Africa owes me something, uh, without even knowing the story of what how Africa has been just as raped and abused and mistreated and exploited as our ancestors are were. You know, in America, just to, just to, just as exploited, just, to, just the same thing. And then when you think about it, when you come over and you look, you say, well, wait a minute. It's not like, you know, they say, well, them African sold us into slavery and all this that and the other. It's not like people just ran off into the sunset and have this, you know, treasure trove of wealth. And, and, and that's what you see happening. You actually can see the abuses. And once I started shifting my mindset and really seeing how our stories are very similar, it's almost like it shifted how I saw wealth. It shifted how I saw beauty. It shifted how I saw people. Because as long as I was carrying an entitled Western Black American mindset, I was deficient. No matter how much money I had, no matter how many connections I had, no matter how popular I might be or whatever, I'm just you know giving terms of you know how people uh, equate things. I said I'm really broke, and that's when I recognized that for me, my mindset everywhere I go, I want to adapt. Even if I might not like the food or something like that, okay, I don't particularly care for the food, but what's something here that I enjoy? What's going on here? Uh, oftentimes I hear, um, you know, African Americans come over to the continent and depending on where they go, the first thing they start doing is complaining, 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 complaining and complaining and just, just complaining and complaining. And it's like, it's like, uh, it's like sometimes you're embarrassed to be even associated because the complaints are just so, you know, and it's like, well, then just go on back, just go on back, but don't complain when you get back to America now, don't. You complain when you're there, you complain when you're in Africa, you complain wherever you go. And and I just knew I did not want to be in that space. I didn't want to be in that space. So wherever I go, I mean, I, there's, there's, for example, if I'm going someplace, I'll have my team go ahead and say, say look, y'all know I need certain kind of accommodations but guess what if they don't have it then I'll stay wherever I'll stay in a I've stayed in two star accommodations I've stayed in three star accommodations I'm not one of them people I can't I can't stay there now I can't do that I slept on the ground climbing a killing in a jar on a tent slept on the ground so then no, no mattress no nothing so it's not it's I'm not by any means uh above staying in a two star hotel because, you know, I'm not, I won't say the particular country that this happened in. Uh, and I don't think it was quite two star. Mm, yeah. Well, no, I'll tell you, I, well, no, one place I stayed, it was a negative star. Uh, <laughs> that Ubudu cattle ranch in Nigeria. Oh my God, I, I can't wait to share with you. And Nigeria knows I love Nigeria, so this that has no reflection on the people or anything like that. It's, I'm, t I'm talking about that voodoo cattle ranch up there in the mountains. I, good God almighty. Oh, that was the worst experience ever. 
But then when I went out and I got the uh, I got the Abuja and I got the Legos, it was the best experience ever. Uh, and and the reason why I was bad at voodoo was because there was no water, there were no towels, there was no toilet paper, there was nothing, there was no power. But yet they wanted me to still pay. And the tour operator was really on the tour operator. Um, that was the one who who you know who jacked that whole thing up. That's a whole other story. But again, that doesn't stop me from loving Nigeria. That doesn't stop me from wanting to go to Nigeria. I had a bad experience at the Ubudu cattle ranch. That's it. That one place, I had that bad experience at the Ubudu cattle ranch. It did not ruin the whole country of Nigeria and all of what Nigeria has to offer because of that one experience. I remember the first time I went to Ghana. And I told the guy, I said, look, I'm gonna book my own hotel accommodations. Cause a lot of times what'll happen is this is this is the this is the hustle, how they do it. Basically, they tell you to you come in, they give you a price, they'll put the hotel in, but then the hotel is not gonna be what you're expecting. You know, something that my instincts told me that nah. So the his crew, whoever he sent to pick me up, didn't know that there was a difference in the hotel. We weren't, the hotels were not going to be, I was going to stay at one hotel and another hotel after I went to, you know, so I said, I told him, I said, you can do this one hotel, but I got these other two because I just knew, but they didn't know. So they took me to the first hotel. We pulled up to the hotel. I was like, no, this isn't what I, this isn't what I booked. And they were like, no, you go in your rooms, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> so this is my first trip to Africa back then. So they got me to the right hotel, and they were like, oh, this is the expensive hotel. And I was thinking to myself, this is like a four-star. This isn't really the expensive one. This is not the Kempinski. Uh, but, hey, okay, we'll go with it. Um, but but the deal is, is that, you know, there were a couple other hotels along the way that were, you know, probably two-star. Give it a, Yeah, I can't even give it a three-star. It was like a two-star. But, okay, cool. All right, well, you adapt. You do what you got to do, and you keep it moving, you know, but some... People, it's to their own detriment because they don't get the experience of having to adjust their own uppitiness. uppitiness. You know, the, it's like, the, so the thing is, and I guess for me as someone coming from America, I just didn't want to be that person who had this attitude um, of, of white supremacy. That, that's really what it boils down to. And 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 we said, well, these are nice things. Now I'm not talking about if something is just hardcore and uh, like Ubudu. You know, that's unacceptable. That's not something I would encourage anybody to accept. But but I had to learn to adapt. And you know what? I found something good out of Ubudu. The bed was really nice. I still slept well because I adjusted. There was no the food wasn't right. I had to eat peanuts and drink my water that I had to keep stuff with me, and that was my dinner. And I adapted. And I said, okay, get me out of here, y'all. And then my team and folks in Kenya and Ghana, everybody was, you know, they worked that thing out. They got me out of there. That was it. That was it, you know? Uh, um, what else? Um, but, you know, the thing about that, though, for me, I realized that, you know, the Europeans adapt, the Asians adapt. They make it happen. And we adapt, too, because I, I know some brothers and sisters that have adapted, you know, like Tim Swain and I, we have a lot of good conversations and he talks about how he's had to adapt, you know, in living in Ghana and some of the different things, you know, those, and, uh, but you know what? Because a lot of times people say, well, we want to make it easy for you. That's our problem. That's what I believe for me as African-Americans, our problem is the fact that we're always looking for something to be easy. And I'm not talking about those people who don't look. I'm just talking about just culturally, we're looking for things to be easy, easy jobs. That's why many of us look for the jobs where we can sit and do nothing and collect a check, but we really aren't stretched within our, our, our capacity because if we're ever stretched within the capacity, then we're forced to grow. And so if I can pacify you and just give you a check, you never become a threat. You'll always be happy for the check. You'll lay back, collect it, and just kind of be lazy throughout the whole thing, you know, for, for those who have that particular mindset. But when I come over here, and, and one, thing, one thing I'll tell you about wealth, sometimes people assume that you just, you just have money and you can just do certain things without really knowing the journey and the dues that you pay in order to get to where you have to do, get to where you have to be. 
people who think like that, who just think, oh, it just happened. But clearly, those are normally the people who, and I'm not knocking any, any professions or anything, but I'm just saying this is a particular mindset that I've observed over the years where they've just been trained to collect a check, where other people have been trained to build and do things and, 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 and create jobs for people. That particular mindset is not used to having to adapt because they've been used to just being given a check and we're going to make everything easy for you. So the easy process, easy, 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 easy. And, and what I've discovered is that people who like it easy are easily exploited, easily manipulated, and easily played because the, more, the easier you make it, the easier it is for them to either get into trouble and it's hard for them to get out. It's, it's, you know, it's layers to it and we can go down a whole other road with that. Um, uh, now, this is something that I thought about, you know, another, another piece of it. Uh, Africans don't want African-Americans coming who have the wrong mindset because those African Americans will drive you up a wall. They will drive you straight crazy. They will, they will have you. If they're coming with the wrong mindset, they will drive you crazy. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you that they will. You, you will be. Like, you will say, "Go back," and that's probably where a lot of people start talking about that whole Liberia thing. Um, but what I try to do is, get, you know, encourage African Americans or Afro Canadians and Afro uh, Brits to, you know, get some cultural training before you to go go to whatever country you're going to, or at least be willing to make, um, be willing to adapt. Let's see what else. Uh, hmm. <laughs> This is another part of, um, and I know I was talking about, you know, why I still don't have a favorite African country. I think I made that point. Is I find something nice in all the countries, and I, I eventually I'm, I have some, I have some that I'm leaning towards. You know, the more that you spend time in a country, you're kind of like, oh, okay, okay. I mean, obviously, you know, I really like Ghana. I really like South Africa. Uh, I really like Tanzania. You know. Um, but man, that Senegal and the Gambia got me thinking, you know, so <laughs> it really, I mean, oh man, the acres of Gambia, I got to go hang out with them. There are people I want to hang out with and kick it with, you know, just because I didn't get a chance to spend enough time in the Gambia. That's the thing. And I think that just depending on what, like if I, I like if I'm writing or something, where would I want to write? I would want to write in the Gambia. I'm not going to be able to write in South Africa. All right, it's just too much going on. I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. So if I need to go write somewhere, I can see myself writing in the Gambia or Cote d'Ivoire. I don't even really see myself writing in Ghana like that because I just know too many people. I'm out kicking it. I'm like hanging out. Just, I mean, it's just like a real chill, fun place to be. Definitely not writing in Kenya. I can tell you that, right? Too much going on. That road be too big. Too many things happening. Mombasa has too many things going on. Uh, I, I can't see myself... I can see, you know what? I can see myself writing in Zanzibar because it's just really chill. I can see myself writing in Seychelles. These are places where I could go. I'm not writing anything in Egypt. Just too much going on. Too many, too, too much going on. I could write in Ethiopia. I could see that. Um, where else? Uh, Togo, Benin. I could write in Togo, Benin. I could write in Sierra Leone. You know, the thing that I really liked about Sierra Leone was just the vibe. It was just, you know, it was. It felt to me like a cross between Zanzibar and Ghana. That's what Sierra Leone felt like. Some of the most, I could write Sierra Leone all day. Some of the nicest beaches ever in Sierra Leone. I could definitely write Sierra Leone. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all of that. And this is why when you go to different places, you get a chance to absorb different things. I just didn't want to be that uppity Negro from America that was coming over here complaining about everything and entitled. I don't know, you complaining about everything. I just didn't want to be that deficient within myself. I just didn't, and and that's why I'm on. I could be in Table Mountain this week. I could be in Seychelles the next. 
I can be in Morocco, I can be and be just as comfortable and enjoying it and loving it. And that's what makes the entire continent of Africa beautiful. That I really don't have to pick because there's so much to choose from. Today I can pick this, tomorrow I can pick that. I can celebrate the people across the board. That's just me. I mean, like I said, I'm, I have some places that I'm, I keep going back to, so that, that, that's a sign, you know, <laughs> that if I keep going back somewhere, then I might, I might like it. Uh, but, you know, but time, you know, there's a limited amount of time. You know, I had to steal these two and a half months to, to do this because I know the latter part of the year, I'm going to be really, really focused on um, building these tours out and making these experiences happen for people. So I'm not going to have time to, like, do what I just did go to 10 countries in two and a half months uh, on, on the exploratory um, portion of the, of the tours of what we're doing, curating these experiences. So, I, but, oh, man. Anyway, I'm going to continue to enjoy South Africa. I'll be here a few more days, back in the DMV, headed to Atlanta, going to be speaking at a travel show there, and then continuing to build this and inspiring people to come visit and settle wherever you find your comfort zone, your comfort in Africa, meaning you don't have to move here, but you, you can visit, you know, and see and experience it. You know, it, it's, it's, it, it will change you. Uh, if you do it with the right mindset, it will change you in a positive way. And when you go back to America, you can go back and tell a different narrative and you can create your little shelf in your room with all the different, um, souvenirs that you've collected throughout the continent. I'm going to have to like get a room in my house just, just for everything that I have and everything that I want to bring back. And, and you know, one day share with my grandchildren. Say, hey, you know what? I got that. One day I hope to take my grandchildren. How about that? I don't have any grandchildren yet, but hey, one day I hope I can take grandchildren uh, and, and inspire people with daring and destiny and all of that. And it all comes by way of celebrating the unique qualities of each place that I've been. That's the deal. And that's what I enjoy. So I hope that that's something that you would do, even if you just visit one place. Uh, and we would love for you to go with us and create an experience for you so that you can have this to share with your family and we can just continue to change these narratives, break this thing down, and just become wiser and better people as a result of it as we chip away at 500 years of intentional mental oppression that we are chipping away at little by little and it's quite effective so anyway until next time take care be safe you know what to do click the subscribe hit that notification bell pick up the darren and destiny uh, book bundles at darrenanddestiny.com make sure you do all of that and that's how we change the narratives all right take care be safe